foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and maker is God. By faith he received power to generate, even though he was past the normal age, and Sarah herself was sterile. For he thought that the one who had made the promise was trustworthy, so it was that there came forth from one man, himself as good as dead, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sands on the seashore. All these died in faith. They did not receive what had been promised, but saw it and greeted it from afar, and acknowledged themselves to be strangers and aliens on earth. For those who speak thus show that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had come, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better homeland, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was ready to offer his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac descendants shall bear your name. He reasoned that God was able to raise even from the dead, and he received Isaac back as a symbol. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. St. Luke, be my mind, my lips, Lord, and in my heart. Jesus said to his disciples, gird your loins and light your lamps, and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself have the servants recline at table and proceed to wait on them. And should he come in the second or third watch and find them prepared in this way, blessed are those servants. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour when the thief was coming, he would not let his house be broken into. You also must be prepared for an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Just a brief announcement. As we all know, Mark Verano's last week as organist is, is now, we have a, hired a new organist and her name is Sandy Bach. Yeah, and we were interviewing her, and they, they have to play a religious song, a responsorial song, and then they play a classical music of their choice, you know, whatever they want. And she played Mendelssohn. So she played this beautiful piece. I said, Sandy, really? You come in here with your name Bach, and you're playing Mendelssohn? We hired her anyway, because she's wonderful. But she's been playing for 25 years. She has a degree in music, some graduate work in both music and theology. She's a mother and a wife, and it's exciting to have you here. So thank you, Sandy.
Sandy's kind of making up for it. She's playing Bach at the end of Mass this weekend. This gospel today speaks, it sounds like in using servant language, but it's a little strict. It's talking about the end of our life. Are we going to remain faithful to the end of life because we never know when our life is going to be taken, right? And it really goes to say, like, where are our hearts? Where's our passions lie? And you know, this Catholic author was writing and he was going to Google a passion for faith. And he, he wasn't sure what to, he was going to put different words of faith and he wasn't sure what to use for that word. And he put a passion for, and then he was going to type in faith or something related to religion. And he, he wasn't sure and it paused. But then it scrolled down. And he said he was amazed because over 120 different things came up. A passion for birds, needlepoint. He said passions for everything but not one single thing about faith or inspiration. And he said, isn't that amazing? He said, you know, our culture says that we can go to a rock concert or a political rally or a sports game and we can shout our heads off, we can go crazy, we can yell and people congratulate us for being so sports orientating and being optimistic about our teams. He said, if you acted that way in a church or about our faith, he said, you'd be considered a nutcase or a fanatic. He said, we're allowed to get emotional about everything but our faith. And I thought, that's so true, isn't it? It's so true. But if we don't have a passion, my friends, there's no power, there's no results, right? If our hearts are all divided into different areas, there's no results, is there? I don't know if you've ever heard of Shelly Pennefather. She played basketball at Villanova during the 80s, 83 to 87. She won the most prestigious trophy in her senior year for being the most outstanding basketball player throughout the whole United States. Her scoring record that she set at Villanova is still there today, since 1987. She was a phenomenal shooter way before the three-point line. She had, she had six, there were six children in her family. She's six one. There was six children in eight years. I'm looking at that. Mom was saying that they had, they had six and 10 years and mom thought that was a lot. Her mother, Mary Jane, would pray the rosary with the kids before they would go to bed. And she continued out through high school. So as late as they came in, they would pray the rosary before they would go to bed. After college, she went to Japan and was given a $200,000 contract, the highest contract for a female athlete at the time. And then she played basketball for three years in Japan as a professional athlete, and she hated it. She never felt comfortable there, and she just felt out of place. I'm gonna pause for a moment and just tell you where I read this article. It was written, this article was written in ESPN website. It was by, her name is Elizabeth Sherl, who wrote it, and I recommend that you read it, because it's a great article. I was looking up a golf score, believe it, and, and found this. But you know, it showed a picture of her, and it said, what happened to Shelley Penneforth? Was the title of the author, or the title of the article. And it showed a, a, a woman in a, in a nun's outfit, full, full, uh, full habit. So it caught my attention, and I read the article. The third, in her third year of Japan playing um, basketball in her break, she went on a retreat. And the retreat master gave her a verse to reflect on, and it said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And she went into the chapel after praying that. She genuflected, like here, and she said, 
20 feet away from me, I realized that God is there. She said, I finished my prayers and left. The next day, she came back into the chapel. She genuflected like she always does and realized that she was no longer alone. Shortly thereafter, Shelley Pennifer joined the poor Claire's as Sister Rose Marie. This religious order, according to the article, they sleep on straw masses, mattresses. They wake up every night at 12.30, never resting more than four straight hours at a time. They're barefoot 23 hours a day, except for the one hour in which they walk around the courtyard in sandals. They never leave the monastery, except for a medical emergency. They don't call, email, or text anyone unless it's to respond to someone. And really, the most of that's done through letters, she said. She gets two family visits per year, but converses through a see-through screen. She said every 25 years, she can hug her family. This is where the article took place. Elizabeth Sherl attended that 25th anniversary and was there for that celebration. And she watched her hug, hug her mother for the first time in 25 years, and her father had since passed away. But she said, you know, looking back now, the Lord kind of took me and put me here, she said. She said, he was asking me to do something radical which was the hardest thing I ever did. She said, but I'm grateful I did. She said, I love this life. She said, I wish all of you could live it for just a little while. It's so peaceful. I feel like I'm not under living my life, but I'm living life to the full. She said, I'm incarcerated and I love it. She kids about being in, in their prison, incarcerated. I read that article, my friends, and even in the article, she was dating a boy through all these years. And she told her then boyfriend that she's going into the convent. And you don't really hear anything about him until the end of the article. He went on to become a priest as well. Yeah, so it's a beautiful story. The whole thing is just phenomenal. But you know, my friends, I'm reading this article, I'm thinking, look at all she gave up. She must be getting something back. See, her God is so close to her. And you know, my friends, and fills her with everything she needs. And that same God is just as close to you and I. We're not called to live a poor Claire life, but we need to be present that our God is right there, don't we? And how he can fill each one of us as well. A good servant, like this gospel talks about, knows his master well, knows his master well, and the master always takes care of a good servant, doesn't he? So this week, may we reflect on getting to know our master and being a good servant. God bless you.